Hello, and welcome to the course. I am Dion, a program manager at Google. I've worked in security for the past five years in areas ranging from risk management to insider threat detection. I'll be your first instructor in this course. As a security analyst, you will help protect the assets of the organization you work for, including tangible or physical assets such as software and network devices, as well as intangible assets like PII, copyrights, and intellectual property. Imagine if this kind of sensitive information were to be exposed by a threat actor. It would be devastating to the reputation and financial stability of the organization and the people the organization serves. In previous courses, we discussed a variety of topics that are relevant to the security profession, including core security concepts, frameworks and controls, threats, risks, and vulnerabilities, networks, incident detection and response, and programming basics. Now it's time to put all of these core security concepts to practical use. In this course, we'll further explore how to protect assets and communicate incidents. Then, we'll discuss when and how to escalate incidents to protect an organization's assets and data. We'll also cover how to communicate effectively to influence stakeholders' decisions related to security. After that, Emily, your instructor for the second part of this course, will introduce some reliable resources that will help you engage with the security community after you complete this certificate program. And finally, we'll cover how to find, prepare for, and apply for security jobs. This will include discussions about how to create a compelling resume and tips to help you throughout the interview process. When I started my first security base role, I was excited to be hired at Google to protect information and devices. I was also happy to be a part of a broader team that I could learn from and reach out to for support. My team helped me grow my expertise, and I'm proud of my contribution to our projects. By the end of this course, you'll have had multiple opportunities to refine your understanding of key security concepts, create a resume, build confidence in your interview skills, and even participate in an artificial intelligence or AI-generated interview. The security profession is such an amazing field, and I'm looking forward to you joining it. I have one question for you. Are you ready to get started? Welcome to the first section of the course. In the next several videos, we'll discuss what it means to have a security mindset and how you'll use that mindset to protect an organization's assets and data. Then, we'll explore the process of incident escalation in the event of a breach. Finally, we'll share information to better help you understand the sensitive nature of the data that you'll work to protect. Coming up, we'll focus on how to develop a security mindset, then use that mindset to protect organizations and the people they serve. Let's take a little time to discuss a concept that would help you throughout your security career, having a security mindset. In previous courses, we discussed various threats, risks, and vulnerabilities and how they can impact organizational operations and the people served by those organizations. These concepts are key considerations when thinking about having a security mindset. You'll have to recognize not only what you're defending, but what or who you're defending against. For example, it's important to recognize the types of assets that are essential to maintaining an organization's business functions along with types of threats, risks, and vulnerabilities that can negatively impact those assets. And that's what having a security mindset is all about. A security mindset is the ability to evaluate risk and constantly seek out and identify the potential or actual breach of a system, application, or data. Earlier in the program, we discussed threats, risks, and vulnerabilities that are posed by social engineering attacks, such as phishing. These attacks are designed to compromise an organization's assets to help the threat actor or actors gain access to sensitive information. Using our security mindset can help prevent these types of attacks. It's important that we're constantly staying up to date with the kinds of attacks that are happening. To do this, 
it's good to develop a habit of seeking out information regarding the latest security trends or vulnerabilities. As you do this, new ideas for protecting company data may come to mind. Security is an everyday objective for every security team in the industry. So having a security mindset helps analysts defend against the constant pressure from attackers. That mindset can make you think every click of the mouse has the potential to lead to a security breach. That level of scrutiny as a security professional helps you prepare for the worst case scenario, even if it doesn't happen. Entry level analysts can help protect low level assets, such as an organization's guest Wi-Fi network and high importance assets, such as intellectual property, trade secrets, PII, and even financial information. Your security mindset allows you to protect all levels of assets. However, if an incident does occur, that doesn't mean you respond to all incidents in the same way. So we'll discuss incident prioritization a little later in the course. Having a strong security mindset can help set you apart from other candidates as you prepare to enter the security profession. It may even be a good idea to reference that foundation in future job interviews. We'll discuss interview preparation in detail later in the course. Coming up, we'll focus on incident detection in greater detail. Welcome back. In earlier courses, we discussed the impact that security incidents can have on the critical data and assets of an organization. If data and assets are compromised, it can lead to financial pains for an organization. It can even lead to regulatory fines and the loss of credibility with customers or other businesses in the same industry. This is why your role in protecting company data and assets is so valuable. Collaboration is an exciting part about working in security. There are so many individuals across an organization that are interested in various functions of security. No security professional can do this alone. Some team members are focused on protecting sensitive financial data. Others work on protecting usernames and passwords. Some are more focused on protecting third-party vendor security. And others may be concerned with protecting employees' PII. These stakeholders and others have an interest in the role the security team plays for keeping the organization and the people it serves safe from malicious attacks. It's important to recognize that the assets and data you protect affect multiple levels of your organization. One of the most important concerns for an organization is the protection of customer data. Customers trust that an organization they engage with will protect their data at all times. This means credit card numbers, social security numbers, emails, usernames, passwords, and so much more. It's important to keep this in mind when taking on a security role. Understanding the importance of the data you're protecting is a big part of having a strong security mindset. As a security professional, it's important to handle sensitive data with care, while being mindful of the little details to ensure that private data is protected from breaches. When a security event results in a data breach, it is categorized as a security incident. However, if the event is resolved without resulting in a breach, it's not considered an incident. It's better to be safe when it comes to taking a job in the security profession. That means paying attention to details and raising your issues to your supervisor. For example, a seemingly small issue, like an employee installing an app on their work device without getting permission from the help desk, should be escalated to a supervisor. This is because some apps have vulnerabilities that can pose a threat to the security of the organization. An example of a bigger issue is noticing that a log may have malicious code executed in it. Malicious code can lead to operational downtime, severe financial consequences, or the loss of critical high-level assets. The point is that there are no issues that are too small or too big. If you're not sure of the potential impact of an incident, it's always best to be cautious and report events to the appropriate team members. Each day on the job as a security professional comes with a level of responsibility to help protect the organization and the people it serves. The decisions you make not only affect the company, but also its customers and countless team members across the organization. Remember, what you do matters. 
you've had an opportunity to learn more about the important role an entry-level analyst plays in protecting the data and assets of an organization. Let's quickly review what we covered. We started off by discussing the importance of having a security mindset, including how it supports incident detection. Then we examined the relationship between incidents and events, and further explored the incident escalation process. We ended our discussion by exploring the sensitive nature of the data that you're protecting and the amount of people counting on you to play your part in protecting that data. Understanding how valuable you are as a member of the security team can help you put the work you do into perspective. Every role in security matters. Each individual contributes to making a company's operations flow smoothly. I hope you enjoyed our discussion as much as I did. Are you ready to continue your journey into the security world? Coming up, we'll discuss the importance of escalating security incidents. I'm excited that you could join me today. Previously, you learned about the importance of various asset types. You also learned about the relationship between incidents and events. Now, we'll focus on escalating those incidents and events to the right people. Protecting the data and assets of an organization is the primary goal of a security team. The decisions you make every day are important for helping the security team achieve that goal. Recognizing when and how to escalate security incidents is crucial. It helps ensure simple issues don't become larger problems for an organization. Escalation is a term you should familiarize yourself with. It's likely to resurface often as you continue your journey into the security profession. In the following videos, we'll discuss incident escalation from an entry-level analyst perspective. Then, we'll explore various incident classification types and the impact security incidents can have on business operations. Finally, we'll share some general guidelines for escalating incidents. Coming up, we'll start by focusing on incident escalation and how it can be used to prevent a seemingly small issue from becoming a bigger problem. Let's get started. Security analysts are hired to protect company assets and data, including knowing when and how to escalate security incidents. In this video, we'll define security incident escalation and discuss your role in making decisions that help protect your organization's data and assets. So what is incident escalation? And why is it so important for security professionals? Incident escalation is a process of identifying a potential security incident, triaging it, and, if appropriate, handing it off to a more experienced team member. It's important to also recognize that not every incident needs to be escalated. In this video, we'll cover what types of incidents should be escalated. As an entry-level analyst, it's unlikely that you'll be responding to security incidents independently. However, it's important that you know how to evaluate and escalate incidents to the right individual or team when necessary. Let's discuss the essential skills needed to properly escalate security incidents. There are two essential skills that would help you identify security incidents that need to be escalated. Attention to detail, and an ability to follow an organization's escalation guidelines or processes. Attention to detail will help you quickly identify when something doesn't seem right within the organization's network or systems. Following a company's escalation guidelines or processes will help you know how to properly escalate the issue you've identified. Larger organization security teams have many levels, and each level or member of that team plays a major role in protecting the company's assets and data. However, smaller and medium-sized companies have only one or two people responsible for the organization's security. For now, we'll focus on the roles in bigger organizations. From the Chief Information Security Officer, also known as the CISO, to the engineering team, public relations team, and even the legal team, every member of the security team matters. Each team member's role depends on the nature and scope of the incident. These roles are highlighted within a company's escalation process. Even the smallest security incident can become a much larger issue if not addressed. And that's where you come in. 
Imagine you're working at your desk and notice what appears to be a minor incident, but you decide to take a break before addressing or escalating it. This decision could have major consequences. If a small issue goes unescalated for too long, it has the potential to become a larger problem that costs the company money, exposes sensitive customer data, or damages the company's reputation. However, with a high level of attention to detail and an ability to follow your organization's escalation guidelines and processes, it may be possible to avoid exposing the business and its customers to harmful incidents. As an entry-level analyst, you play an important role. You help the security team identify issues within the network and systems and help make sure the right person on the team is alerted when incidents occur. Think about an assembly line. Would the final step on the line be negatively impacted if the first step were done incorrectly or not at all? Of course it would. Every decision you make helps the entire security team protect an organization's assets and data. Knowing when and how to escalate security incidents is one of many important decisions you'll need to make on a daily basis. Later in this course, we'll discuss the various levels of security incidents. Knowing those levels will help you determine the level of urgency needed to escalate different incident types. Previously, we defined what it means to escalate an incident. We also discussed the skills needed to properly escalate incidents when the time comes. In this video, we're going to cover a few incident classification types to be aware of. Malware infection, unauthorized access, and improper usage. A malware infection is the incident type that occurs when malicious software designed to disrupt a system infiltrates an organization's computers or network. As discussed in a previous course, Malware infections can come in many forms. Some are simple and others are a bit more complex. One example is a phishing attempt. These are relatively simple malware infections. Another example is a ransomware attack, which is considered much more complex. Malware infections can cause a system's network to run at unusually low speeds. Attackers can even prevent an organization from viewing critical data unless the organization pays the attacker a ransom to unlock the data. This incident type is especially impactful to an organization because of the amount of sensitive data stored on an organization's network and computers. Escalating malware infections is an important aspect of protecting the organization that you work for. But wait, there's more. The second incident type we'll discuss is unauthorized access. This is an incident type that occurs when an individual gains digital or physical access to a system or application without permission. As you may recall, earlier in the program we discussed brute force attacks, which use trial and error to compromise passwords, login credentials, and encryption keys. These attacks are often used to help attackers gain unauthorized access to an organization systems or applications. All unauthorized access incidents are important to escalate. However, the urgency of that escalation depends on how critical that system is to the organization's business operations. We'll explore this idea in more detail later in this course. The third incident we'll discuss is improper usage. This is an incident type that occurs when an employee of an organization violates the organization's acceptable use policies. This one can be a bit complicated. There are instances when improper usage is unintentional. For example, an employee may attempt to access software licenses for personal use or even use a company system to access a friend's or co-worker's data. Maybe the employee wasn't aware of the policy they were violating. Or maybe the policy wasn't properly defined and communicated to employees but there are other times where improper usage is an intentional act. So how do you know if an improper usage incident is accidental or intentional? That can be a difficult decision to make. That's why improper usage incidents should always be escalated to a supervisor. As a member of an organization's security team, it's likely that you'll encounter a variety of incident types while on the job. So it's important to know what they are and how to escalate them. So far, 
we've discussed different incident types and the importance of escalating those incidents to the right person. But what happens if an incident goes unescalated for too long? In this video, we'll discuss the potential impact that even the smallest incident can have on an organization if it goes unnoticed. Are you ready? Great! Now let's take a journey into the life of an organization security team. It's been a quiet day for the security team. Suddenly, you notice there's been unusual log activity in an app that was recently banned from the organization. You make a note to mention this activity during the next meeting with your supervisor. But you forget and never mention it. Following this same scenario, let's fast forward to a week later. You and your supervisor are meeting again. But now, the supervisor indicates that a data breach has occurred. This breach has impacted one of the manufacturing sites for the organization. Now all operations at the manufacturing site have been put on hold. This causes the company to lose money and precious time. Days later, the security team discovers that the data breach began with suspicious activity in the app that was recently banned from the organization. What we've learned from this scenario is that a simple incident can lead to a much larger issue if not escalated properly. Incident criticality is also important to note here. Initially, an incident can be escalated with a medium level of criticality if the analyst doesn't have enough information to determine the amount of damage done to the organization. Once an experienced incident handler reviews the incident, the incident may be increased or decreased to a high or low criticality level. Every security incident you encounter is important to an organization, but some incidents are certainly more urgent than others. So, what's the best way to determine the urgency of a security incident? It really depends on the asset or assets that the incident affects. For example, if an employee forgets their login password for their work computer, a low-level security incident may be prompted if they have repeated failed login attempts. This incident needs to be addressed, but the impact of this incident is likely minimal. In other instances, assets are critical to an organization's business operations, such as a manufacturing plant or database that stores PII. These types of assets need to be protected with a higher level of urgency. The impact of an attacker gaining unauthorized access to a manufacturing application or PII is far greater than a forgotten password because the attacker could interfere with the manufacturing processes or expose private customer data. I hope this video has helped you understand the importance of knowing the relationship between assets and security incidents. Later in this course, we'll share some new concepts related to escalation timing and why your role in that process matters. We've shared quite a bit about the importance of your role when it comes to escalating incidents. We've even discussed a few incident types that you may encounter. But what are the actual steps you need to take to properly escalate an incident? The answer to that question actually depends on the organization you're working for. There isn't a set standard or process for incident escalation that all organizations use. Every security team has their own processes and procedures when it comes to handling incidents. In this video, we're going to discuss general guidelines for incident escalation and how to apply them on the job. Let's get started. Each organization has its own process for handling security incidents. That process is known as an escalation policy, which is a set of actions that outline who should be notified when an incident alert occurs and how that incident should be handled. Ideally, the escalation process would go smoothly every time. But in the workplace, challenges to that process can happen unexpectedly. For example, what if your immediate supervisor is out of office? If an incident occurs that day, it still needs to be escalated to someone. This is one example of why understanding your organization's escalation policy is important. You don't need to memorize your organization's escalation policy but it is wise to save or bookmark it on your work device. This way, you'll always have access to it when you need it. Following an organization's escalation policy is essential. 
because the actions you take help protect the organization and the people it serves from malicious actors. The escalation policy for an organization can be an extensive document. So it's up to you to pay attention to the small details within the escalation policy of your organization. Attention to detail can make the difference between escalating an incident to the right or wrong person. It can also help you prioritize which incidents need to be escalated with more or less urgency. Every organization handles incident escalation differently, but analysts need to ensure that incidents are handled correctly. Great work expanding your security mindset. Now you've had an opportunity to learn about the essential role you'll be playing by escalating incidents. Let's review what we've covered in this section of the course. We started off by defining incident escalation and discussing useful traits needed to properly escalate incidents. We also explored a few incident classification types and their potential impacts on organization. From there, we discuss how small security incidents can become bigger problems if not properly addressed. Finally, we covered some general guidelines for the actual process of incident escalation. This process varies depending on the organization you work for, but one thing should always remain the same, your attention to detail. Understanding how each incident affects the data and assets of an organization is really important because the decisions you make can affect the entire security team and organization. Are you ready to continue your security journey? Coming up, we'll discuss stakeholders and how to communicate effectively with them. We've covered so much in previous courses, from the foundations of security to a basic understanding of networks and programming languages like SQL and Python. These concepts are core knowledge when preparing for a role in the security profession. But how does this information help you on a day-to-day -day basis? And to whom do you communicate this information? In this course, we'll start by discussing who stakeholders are. Then, we'll identify their roles in relation to security. Finally, we'll share effective communication strategies for relaying key information to stakeholders. But before we can communicate with stakeholders, we have to understand who they are and why they're important. So let's get started. Let's discuss the hierarchy within an organization. It goes from you, the analysts, to management, all the way up to executives. Hierarchy is a great way to understand stakeholders. A stakeholder is defined as an individual or group that has an interest in the decisions or activities of an organization. This is important for your role as an entry-level analyst because the decisions made on a day-to-day -day basis by stakeholders will impact how you do your job. Let's focus on stakeholders who have an interest in the daily choices analysts make. After all, you may be asked to communicate your findings to them. So let's learn a little bit more about who they are and the roles they play in regards to security. Security threats, risks, and vulnerabilities can affect an entire company's operations. From financial implications to the loss of customer data and trust, the impact of security incidents are limitless. Each stakeholder has a responsibility to provide inputs on the various decisions and activities of the security team and how to best protect the organization. There are many stakeholders that pay close attention to the security of critical organizational assets and data. We're going to focus on five of those stakeholders. Risk managers, the chief executive officer, also known as the CEO, the chief financial officer, also known as the CFO, the chief information security officer, or CISO, and operation managers. Let's discuss each of these stakeholders in more detail. Risk managers are important to an organization because they help identify risks and manage the response to security incidents. They also notify the legal department regarding regulatory issues that need to be addressed. Additionally, risk managers inform the organization's public relations teams in case there is a need to publish public communications regarding an incident. Next is the chief executive officer, also known as the CEO. This is the highest ranking person in an organization. 
CEOs are responsible for financial and managerial decisions. They also have an obligation to report to shareholders and manage the operations of a company. So naturally, security is a top priority for the CEO. Now let's discuss the chief financial officer known as the CFO. CFOs are senior executives responsible for managing the financial operations of a company. They are concerned about security from a financial standpoint because of the potential cost of an incident to the business. They are also interested in the costs associated with tools and strategies that are necessary to combat security incidents. Another stakeholder with an interest in security is the Chief Information Security Officer, or CISO. CISOs are high-level executives responsible for developing an organization's security architecture and conducting risk analysis and system audits. They're also tasked with creating security and business continuity plans. Last, we have operations managers. Operations managers oversee security professionals to help identify and safeguard an organization from security threats. These individuals often work directly with analysts as the first line of defense when it comes to protecting the company from threats, risks, and vulnerabilities. They are also generally responsible for the daily maintenance of security operations. As an entry-level analyst at a large organization, it's unlikely that you'll communicate directly with the risk manager, CEO, CFO, or the CISO. However, the operations manager will likely ask you to create communications to share with those individuals. Coming up, we'll focus a bit more on stakeholders and how to effectively communicate with them. Welcome back. Previously, we discussed stakeholders and the important security roles they play within an organization. Now, let's explore the role you play in communicating with those stakeholders. The information that's communicated to stakeholders is sensitive. For example, if you send an email to stakeholders about a recent security breach, it's important to be mindful of what you communicate and who you communicate to. Different stakeholders may need to be informed about different issues. As a result, your communications with them need to be clear, concise, and focused. Security is a detail-driven profession, so it's essential that you stay mindful of the details when sending your communications. Stakeholders are very busy people. Your communications should be precise, avoid unnecessary technical terms, and have a clear purpose. You don't want them to have to guess the reason for your email or why it matters to them. To help with this, ask your manager or immediate supervisor's questions to find out what the stakeholders you communicate with need to know. As you may recall, earlier we discussed what it means to have a security mindset. A part of that mindset means asking questions about the assets and data you're protecting. For example, you could ask, what's the most important data to protect on a daily basis? Or what security tool has been most important or useful to protect our data and assets? Having a security mindset also means understanding what matters most to stakeholders so you know what information to share with them. Effective communication involves relaying only the information that is most relevant to stakeholders. Staying informed about security issues helps stakeholders do their jobs more effectively. Your role in communicating with stakeholders is to help them obtain that information. This is yet another example of how essential your role is within a security team. Coming up, we'll discuss the information that is most important to communicate with stakeholders. Previously, we discussed communicating information that is important to stakeholders. It's essential that communications are specific and clear so stakeholders understand what's happening and what actions may need to be taken. In this video, we'll go into more detail about how to create precise and clear communications. Creating security communications to share with stakeholders is similar to telling a great story. Stories typically have a beginning, middle, and end. Somewhere in that story, there is some sort of conflict and an eventual resolution. 
This concept is also true when telling security stories to stakeholders. The security story details what the security challenge is, how it impacts the organization, and possible solutions to the issue. The security story also includes data related to the challenge, its impact, and proposed solutions. This data could be in the form of reports that summarize key findings or a list of issues that may need immediate attention. Let's use the following scenario as an example. You've been monitoring system logs and notice possible malicious code execution in the logs that could lead to the exposure of sensitive user information. Now you need to communicate what is happening to a stakeholder, in this case, your immediate supervisor. The first step is to detail the issue, potential malicious code execution found while monitoring the logs. The next step is to refer to the organization's incident response playbook and mention the suggested guidance from the playbook regarding malicious code found in system logs. This shows your supervisor that you've been paying attention to the procedures already established by the team. The final piece of your story is to provide a possible solution to the issue. In this scenario, you may not be the final decision maker regarding what action is taken, but you've explained to the stakeholder what has happened and a possible solution to the problem. You can communicate the story we just discussed in various ways. Send an email, share a document, or even communicate through the use of a visual representation. You can also use incident management or ticketing systems. Many organizations have incident management or ticketing systems that follow the steps outlined in their security playbooks. Some scenarios are better expressed by using visual elements. Visuals are used to convey key details in the form of graphs, charts, videos, or other visual effects. This allows stakeholders to view a pictorial representation of what is being explained. Visual dashboards can help you tell a full security story to stakeholders. Later in this course, you'll have an opportunity to learn how to use Google Sheets to create a visual security story. That's going to be fun. A security professional who knows how to tell a compelling and concise security story can help stakeholders make decisions about the best ways to respond to an incident. Ideally, you want to be someone that makes stakeholders' jobs easier. And communicating effectively will certainly help you do that. Coming up, we'll continue our discussion about communicating with stakeholders. The ability to communicate threats, risks, vulnerabilities, or incidents, and possible solutions is a valuable skill for security professionals. In this video, we'll focus on various communication strategies that can help you engage with and convey key ideas to stakeholders. Let's start with visuals. The use of visuals to tell a security story can help you communicate impactful data and metrics. Charts and graphs are particularly helpful for this. They can be used to compare data points or show small parts of a larger issue. Using relevant and detailed graphics can help you develop the story you want to tell stakeholders so they can make decisions that would help protect the organization. While visuals are a compelling way to capture the attention of your stakeholders, some issues are best explained in an email or even a phone call. Be mindful of the sensitive information contained in these types of communications. For security purposes, it's important to communicate sensitive information with care. Be sure to follow the procedures outlined in your organization's playbooks and always make sure to send emails to the right email recipient, as it could create a risk if the wrong person receives confidential security information. One challenging thing about emails is the potentially long wait time for a response. Stakeholders have many responsibilities. This means they may sometimes miss an email or fail to respond in a timely manner. In these instances, a simple phone call or instant message may be a better option. My experience in security has taught me that sometimes a simple instant message or a call can help move a situation forward. Direct communication is often better than waiting days or weeks for an email response to an issue that requires immediate attention. 
When appropriate, take the initiative to follow up with a stakeholder if they haven't responded to an email in a timely manner. It sounds simple, but a friendly call can often prevent a major issue from occurring. It's important to stand out in the security profession, especially if you don't have previous experience in the industry. Visual representations, emails, and phone calls are great ways to showcase your written and verbal communication skills. The visual aspect shows your ability to put metrics and data together in an impactful way. If you don't receive a timely response from a stakeholder, following up shows initiative. In this video, we're going to have a bit of fun. We'll create a visual security story. Here's the scenario. The operations manager, one of the stakeholders we previously discussed, has been informed that the chief information security officer, also known as the CISO, wants to know how many employees are often clicking on phishing emails. The goal is to identify which five departments click on those emails most often. An investigation reveals that the five departments that most frequently click on phishing emails are human resources, customer service, global security, media relations, and professional development. Based on this information, the security team can create a visual representation of the data to share with the operations manager and the CISO. Those stakeholders and the security team can then work together to determine how to address the issue. There are many different platforms available that can be used to create and share visual stories of data. Apache OpenOffice is a free, open source office suite that allows users to create spreadsheets and other visual representations. Another no-cost option is Google Sheets. Today, we'll enter our data into Google Sheets. Then, we'll create a bar chart visualization to develop the data story. If you don't have a Google account, you'll need to create one. Let's start by demonstrating how to create an account. First, go to google.com and click on Sign In. Click Create Account and select for my personal use. Then, complete each step to create your personal account. Now that you've created your Google account, it's time for us to begin creating our Google Sheets bar chart visualization. Click the dots menu in the top right corner. Click the Sheets icon. Click blank to start a new spreadsheet. Select cell A1, type department. Select cell B1, type number of clicked phishing emails. Select cell A2, type human resources. Select cell B2, type 30. Select cell A3, type customer service. Select cell B3, type 18. Select cell A4, type global security. Select cell B4, type 10. Select cell A5, type media relations. Select cell B5, type 4-0. Select cell A6, type professional development. Select cell B6, type 2-7. Then, select the rows and columns containing headers, department names, and data. Click Insert at the top of the sheet. Select Chart in the Chart Editor menu. Click Chart Type drop-down menu. Scroll down to the Bar Chart options, then select the first bar chart. In the Chart Editor menu, click Customize. Then click on the Chart and Access Title section. Now, Update the title to read something like Clicked Phishing Emails by Department or another title related to the data. Then click on the X icon at the top of the chart editor to close the editor menu. 
Great job creating your first visual security story. Creating visual stories of data allows security team members to convey essential information to stakeholders, so issues can be communicated in a meaningful and understandable way. These data stories can also help promote a better understanding of issues that exist within an organization and allow decision makers to determine how to address security issues that put the organization at risk. You've had an opportunity to learn about the important role stakeholders play and different ways to communicate with them. Let's review what we covered. We started by defining stakeholders and their roles in protecting an organization. We also explored the sensitive nature of communications with stakeholders and the importance of sharing that information with care and confidentiality. Then, we discussed information that needs to be communicated to stakeholders. After all, stakeholders are extremely busy, so we only want to share relevant information that they need to be aware of. We ended our discussion by introducing various communication strategies, including emails, phone calls, and visual dashboards. Understanding who the stakeholders are within your organization and how to communicate with them will help you throughout your career as a security professional. Be intentional about the strategies you use to communicate. Remove unnecessary details from your communications and be specific and precise when relaying information to stakeholders. Stakeholders are depending on you, as a storyteller, to tell them the security story or the potential issues and solutions in a way that makes sense. The communication strategies we discussed will help you stand out as someone who has a combination of technical and transferable skills. Coming up, your instructor for the final sections of this course, Emily, will discuss a few ways to engage with the security community and how to find and apply for jobs in the security field. Welcome back. I'm Emily, and I've been working in security education at Google for nearly nine years. My team works closely with our remarkable security experts to craft innovative and engaging educational solutions for our workforce to keep security at the forefront. I'll be your instructor for the remainder of the course to discuss important career-related topics, such as how to engage with the security community, find jobs in the security field, create a resume, and navigate the interview process. We're approaching the end of the certificate program. What an incredible journey it's been so far. We've discussed a lot up to this point, including incident detection and escalation, and the roles that stakeholders play in protecting an organization. We've also explored the sensitive nature of the communications we share and strategies for conveying critical information to stakeholders. But does the learning stop now that we're approaching the end of the program? Absolutely not. In the following videos, we'll identify reliable security resources you can use to stay up to date on security news and trends. Then, we'll share some ways to become involved with the security community. We'll end with a discussion about how to establish and advance a career in security. Coming up, we'll highlight some great resources to help you stay current on what's happening in the security industry. As we approach the end of our program, it's important to start thinking about ways to engage with the security community. As the industry evolves, it's essential to stay up to date on the latest security trends and news. Let's discuss a few good resources for you to review periodically. What excites me about the security profession is the constant evolution of the industry. Take the OWASP Top 10, for example. Earlier in the program, we discussed the fact that this is a globally recognized standard awareness document that lists the top 10 most critical security risks to web applications. This list is updated every three to four years, so it's a great example of the evolving nature of the field. Continuing your security education beyond this certificate program will help you stand out to hiring managers and could give you an extra edge over other candidates because it shows your willingness to remain current on what's happening in the industry. A few well-known security websites and blogs to get you started are CSO Online, Krebs on Security, and Dark Reading. 
The CSO online site provides news, analysis, and research on various security and risk management topics. Many CISOs view this site for tips and ideas. It would be great for you to review this publication every now and then. Krebs on Security is an in-depth security blog created by former Washington Post reporter Brian Krebs. This blog covers security news and investigations into various cyber attacks. Accessing the Krebs blog is a good way to stay up to date on the latest security news and happenings around the world. Dark Reading is a popular website for security professionals. This site provides information about various security topics, like analytics and application security, mobile and cloud security, as well as the Internet of Things, IoT. Security is a constantly evolving industry. As professionals in security, we must evolve with it by seeking out new information. Be sure to explore a few of the websites and blogs we discussed in this video to stay up to date with what's happening in the industry. Coming up, we'll discuss how to become engaged with the security community and ways to establish and advance your career in security. Bye for now. Earlier, we discussed the importance of staying up to date on security trends and news. In this video, we're going to share ways to establish and advance your career in security by connecting with people who are already in the industry. Social media is a great way to connect to other security professionals in the industry. However, it's important to be mindful of the information you share on your social media page and when responding to messages from people you don't know. With that in mind, let's discuss ways to effectively use social media to establish or advance your security career. One way to use social media is to follow or read the posts of leaders in the security industry. Chief information security officers, for example, are great individuals to follow. They often post interviews they've done in the security space and share articles they've read or contributed to. Here's a question you might be asking yourself. How can I find CISOs to follow on social media? The best way would be to conduct an internet search for the name of the CISO of a popular organization or an organization you're interested in working for. After you find their name, you can simply go to a social media site to look them up. Ideally, you want to use LinkedIn when following security professionals. That's because the LinkedIn platform focuses on connecting professionals with other professionals in the same or similar field. Another way to use social media to establish or advance your career in the security industry is to connect with other security analysts currently employed in the field. On social networks like LinkedIn, you can find security professionals by searching for cybersecurity analysts or a similar search term, then filtering for people, and people who talk about hashtag cybersecurity. Once you've found other professionals you'd like to connect with, you can send a connection request with a brief comment such as, hi, I'd like to connect to learn more about why you became interested in security and your experiences as an analyst. Additionally, you can set your filter to locate events and groups that focus on security-related topics that interest you. While social media platforms like LinkedIn are excellent for connecting with professionals, some people are more comfortable with being active on social media than others. For those of us who aren't very active on social media, there are other ways to connect with security professionals or find mentors in the industry. Joining different security associations is a good way to connect with others. There are many associations out there, so you're going to have to do a little bit of research to find the best ones for you. Here's a tip. In your internet search engine, type cybersecurity industry associations. This search term will populate a variety of different associations, so be sure to select ones that align with your professional goals. Now that we've discussed ways to engage with the security community, consider following a CISO on LinkedIn, connecting with other analysts, or searching for cybersecurity organizations to join. That's all for now. I'll meet you in the next video. Great job. Now you've had an opportunity to learn about different ways to stay engaged with the security community. Let's take a moment to review what we've covered. First, we identified reliable security resources. Then, we discussed different ways to engage with the security community. 
We also explored the usefulness of social media to connect with other security professionals and stay informed about current topics of interest. Finally, we shared ways to establish and advance a career in security, including following a CISO on social media or joining a professional organization. We've come a long way in this journey. You should be proud of your progress and how far you've come. I'm certainly proud of you. In the final section of this course, we'll take the time to prepare you for the job search and interviewing process. How exciting is that? Welcome back. We've covered so many security-related topics in detail. Throughout this program, we've discussed protecting organizational assets and data, and the tools and procedures used to protect them. We've also explored how to communicate with stakeholders, reliable sources to help you stay up to date on security news and trends, and ways to get involved with the security community to help establish and advance your career in the field. Now, we need to get you prepared to find a job as an entry-level security analyst. Security is a huge field with countless job opportunities. By 2030, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics expects the number of security roles to grow by more than 30%. But how can you find the right opportunity for you? In the next several videos, we'll discuss specific strategies to help you find and apply for jobs in the industry including how to create your resume and develop rapport with interviewers. We'll also cover how to use the STAR method for interviewing and how to develop an elevator pitch. I remember initially being interested in my role because education is my passion. Researching the security field and industry in preparation for my interviews cemented my fascination for cybersecurity. I'll be honest, I had taken a lot of what security does for granted. Now, I feel incredibly fortunate to be a part of this industry and the exciting opportunities it offers. Now it's time to get you ready to find security jobs. Let's get started. I hope you feel really proud of how far you've come. You may remember that earlier in this program, we discussed a few security roles in the industry. Now we'll explore three of those roles. We'll start with security analyst. Security analyst is typically an entry-level role that might interest you as you prepare to enter the security field. The role generally focuses on monitoring networks for security breaches, developing strategies to help secure an organization, and even researching IT security trends. In previous courses, we discussed log monitoring and SIM tools. Having a solid foundational understanding of how to use those tools will certainly be useful in this role. Another role that might interest you is information security analyst. This role generally focuses on creating plans and implementing security measures to protect organizations, networks, and systems. Earlier in the program, you learned about controls and frameworks that can be used to develop security plans and procedures as well as how to use SIMs and packet sniffers to identify risks. That knowledge will be beneficial when it comes to developing plans and determining the best tools to strengthen an organization's security posture. Finally, we'll explore the Security Operations Center Analyst role. Security Operations Center Analyst, also known as a SOC Analyst, is another role you might find exciting. This role generally focuses on ensuring security incidents are handled rapidly and efficiently by following established policies and procedures. Earlier in this program, we discussed security playbooks and how they are unique to each organization. We also covered the importance of being able to follow the processes outlined in playbooks to respond to security events or incidents. That knowledge will certainly help you stand out as a potential candidate for this role. There are many more job roles that you may be interested in. A great way to find more of these roles is to create an account on various job sites and search for cybersecurity positions. A few well-known job sites in the United States and internationally are ZipRecruiter, Indeed, and Monster Jobs. Each of these sites have hundreds of open job listings with roles, 
responsibilities, and skill set requirements posted under the job title. How exciting is it that we're now discussing jobs and sites that you can use to apply for them? It's important that you do your research before applying to any position. Gather plenty of information about the company, the job role, as well as required and preferred skills. This will help prepare you for a potential interview by knowing exactly what the employer is looking for and how your skills align with the employer's expectations. This will also help you align your own values and passions with the organization's mission and vision. But before you can apply for a security job, it's important to create a resume that will catch an employer's attention. Coming up, we'll discuss the resume development process in detail. In this video, we'll discuss how to create a resume that is tailored to the job you're applying for. Note that a resume is sometimes called a curriculum vitae, or CV for short. Remember that it's okay if you don't have any cybersecurity experience. This certificate program has covered key skills and concepts that employers are looking for in an entry-level security analyst position. You can mention all that you've learned in this program on your resume, including programming languages such as Python and SQL and Linux line command. You can also share your understanding of what it means to have a security mindset, your knowledge of standard frameworks and controls like the NIST, CSF, and CIA triad model, as well as your familiarity with how to use SIM tools and packet sniffers. It's also possible that some of your earlier job experiences allowed you to develop knowledge and skills that are transferable to a security role. These skills could include being detail-oriented, collaborative, and having strong written and verbal communication skills. Here's an example of a resume. You'll want to start with your name at the top of the resume, followed by your professional title. Your title could be something like security analyst, or a title that matches the position you're applying for. You'll also want to include at least one way that employers or recruiters can contact you. For example, an email address or phone number. After your name and title, you'll provide a summary statement. This section should be brief, just one or two sentences related to your strengths and relevant skills. Make sure the statement includes specific words from the responsibility section of the job description. You can include something like this in your statement. I am a motivated security analyst seeking an entry-level cybersecurity position to apply my skills in network security, security policy, and organizational risk management. Following your name and summary statement is the skills section. This is a bulleted list of the skills you've learned in this program that are related to the position. Employers usually like to know about your previous work experience. In the experience section, you'll list your work history. Underneath each job entry, provide a list of the skills and responsibilities you performed. It's a good idea to start each bullet with a verb, and if possible, details that quantify an accomplishment. For example, collaborated with a team of six to develop training for more than 25 company employees. Try to highlight the security or technology-related skills and knowledge that you have based on your experiences in previous jobs and this certificate program. The next section of the resume lists your education and certifications. Start with the most recent education you've completed, including certifications, trade schools, online courses, or college experience. Also include the names of sites and organizations that issued your certifications and schools you attended. List any subjects you studied related to the job you're applying for. If you're currently enrolled in school or a certification program but haven't graduated, note, in progress. As you develop your resume, keep a couple of things in mind. Make sure there are no spelling or grammatical errors in your resume before sending it to your potential employer. Also note that resumes are typically about two pages long and list only your last 10 years or less of work experience. Resumes can be created using word processing applications like Google Docs or OpenOffice. 
However, you might find some simple but professional resume templates online to get you started. To find them, type free resume template or a similar search term into your internet browser. If you use a template, be sure to replace all of the pre-filled text with your information and qualifications. There is so much to consider when creating your resume, but what we covered today will help you get started. Coming up, we'll explore the interview process. After you've submitted your resume to several job postings, you'll hopefully get an opportunity for an interview. The interview process usually starts with a short pre-screening phone call. It typically involves having a 15-minute conversation with a hiring manager or recruiter who will ask you some questions to make sure that you are who your resume says you are and that you meet the minimum requirements for the job. Following the pre-screening, you could be invited to an in-person interview, either on-site or online. This could be a panel interview with a few members of the team that you would be working with, or a one-on-one -on -one interview. Let's discuss some strategies that can help prepare you for an interview. Review the job description and your resume ahead of time. Practice speaking about the experiences and skills that the employer is looking for. Consider practicing this with a friend by participating in a mock interview. Your friend will act as the interviewer and you will answer their questions as if you're meeting with the employer. It can also be helpful to dress professionally and feel comfortable in the clothes you choose to wear for the interview. Before the interview begins, take a few deep breaths and remind yourself of all the preparation you've done. If the interview is online via video conference, Prepare a location in your home that is quiet, tidy, and professional. Also, be sure to test your video and audio settings, and if necessary, download the video conference application specified by the interviewer. This will help ensure that you correct any technical issues before the interview. Interviews usually include two parts, a background interview and a technical interview. The background interview will likely include questions about your education, work experience, skills, and abilities. You might even be asked some personal questions unrelated to the job posting. The interviewer is trying to get to know you to determine if you'll be a good match for the team and company culture. At the same time, you want to ask questions to help you decide if the team and company culture are a good match for you. The other portion of the interview is the technical interview. This is when the interviewer will ask you specific questions about technical skills related to the role. You might be asked how you would respond to a specific situation or to explain a technical concept that's listed on your resume. Do your best to answer these types of questions confidently and concisely based on your current knowledge. It's okay to say that you don't know the answer to a question or that you need a moment to respond so you can think about your answer. Employers respect honesty. Just follow up with an explanation of how you would figure out the answer, either by researching it or collaborating with the team. Even after you've completed this certificate program, you'll still have access to all of the content. So before the interview, go back and review your notes, the glossary, and any concepts that you might need to refresh your memory on. This can help you feel prepared for the questions you'll be asked. Remember, you can prepare for the interview by participating in a mock interview, reviewing the job description, and taking a few deep breaths before the interview begins. You've learned a lot in this course and are ready to move ahead and find a position as a security analyst. Coming up, we'll discuss how to conduct pre-interview research. Previously, we discussed how to create a resume and what to expect during an interview. In this video, we're going to cover a few more things that you need to do to prepare for the interview and that could help set you apart as an excellent candidate for the position. Before the interview, it's important to do some research about the organization you're interviewing with. Interviewers want to know that you're a good match for their team and that you value the things that are important to the company. It's just as important for you to decide if the company matches your values. So make sure you know the organization's mission and vision. 
understand their core values and company culture. This information is usually easy to find, either in the job description or on the About page of the organization's website. Think about why these values and the company culture are also important to you. Then, practice how you will communicate this to potential employers. Remember that you will not be the only applicant for the position. Consider what sets you apart from other candidates and be prepared to emphasize those qualities during the interview. What about your skills, experience, or work ethic make you the best match for this position? How do your goals align to the goals of the organization? You want the employer to remember you after they've interviewed several candidates. So highlight things that make you the best candidate for the role. You also want to think about the employer's perspective. The organization has needs that must be met by filling the position. They may have productivity or compliance goals, or the team might be growing because the company is expanding. Take some time to think about what the interviewer is seeking in a candidate. Then prepare yourself to state directly how you can meet the employer's needs. The interviewer may have reservations about hiring you because of your lack of experience as a security analyst. If this comes up in the interview, be prepared to address any possible concerns by speaking about your strong work ethic. This could include an ability to learn quickly based on feedback or to collaborate and communicate with others. Also, you could discuss having a security mindset or problem-solving skills that you've developed from personal life, work, or educational experiences. Learning about the organization's culture and mission and preparing to demonstrate how you can add value to the team are essential. It's also a good idea to write down questions that you can ask the interviewer about the organization's past accomplishments and future goals. This shows potential employers that you've done your research and care about the organization's success. Coming up, we'll discuss how to build rapport with interviewers. In this video, we'll explore a topic that can contribute to your success during the interview process, how to build rapport with your potential employer. Rapport is a friendly relationship in which the people involved understand each other's ideas and communicate well with each other. Building rapport begins with the very first interaction you have with the company's staff by phone, email, or video conference. It's important to use a professional tone in the email you write expressing your interest in the job, but it's also important to be polite and friendly. Expressing appreciation for being considered and having the potential opportunity to interview is one way to build rapport. When and if you have an initial phone screen, you can use a friendly conversational tone of voice. To do this, try smiling while you talk. And while it's true that nobody can see you smile on a phone call, smiling while you talk can make you sound friendlier. During the phone screening and in-person interview, you can ease interview nervousness by engaging actively in a way that feels natural to you. That can mean simply saying, hello, nice to meet you. You can even start a short, friendly conversation by asking the interviewer how their day is going. Or if the weekend just passed, you might ask the interviewer, how was your weekend? Make eye contact when you ask these questions during an in-person interview, or be sure to look directly into the camera during a video interview. This will show the interviewer that you're engaged in the conversation. Oftentimes during the second half of an interview, the interviewer will ask if you have any questions for them. As we discussed earlier, it's important to have some questions prepared to ask at this point. Here are some suggestions. You could ask, what is the biggest challenge I might face coming into this role? And how would I be expected to meet that challenge? Or you might ask, what would you say is the best part about working for this company? Or what is a typical day like for an analyst? Another great question is, what is the potential for growth in this role? Asking questions shows that you're engaged in the conversation and are interested in the company and the position. It also shows the employer that you are confident and that you wanna make sure that their company is a good match for you before you make a commitment. It's nice to send a follow-up email a day or two after your in-person interview. 
This is just a brief email thanking the interviewer for the opportunity to meet with them and learn more about the organization. It's also a good idea to mention something specific from your interview in this email. It shows that you are actively engaged in the conversation. Remember, the employer is probably interviewing other candidates, so sending a follow-up email will help set you apart and remind the interviewer of your discussion. Building rapport with the interviewer and other employees is an important skill when interviewing for your first security position. Writing friendly but professional emails before and after the interview and engaging in friendly conversation during the interview can help set you apart as a great candidate for the job. Welcome back. Preparing for job interviews in the security field is such an exciting process. You've learned a lot through this program that can help you stand out as a candidate. Let's discuss some useful interview strategies to consider when speaking to an employer. Your interviewer is going to ask several questions when you meet. Carefully consider each question before responding. Let's discuss the STAR method, which can help you prepare for interviews. The STAR method is a technique used to answer behavioral and situational interview questions. Using this method is a great way to help you understand each interview question and provide a thoughtful and thorough response. STAR stands for Situation, Task, Action, Result. The STAR method is typically used to answer open-ended questions such as, tell me about a time when you encountered a challenge on the job. Let's go through an example of how this question could be answered using the STAR method. The situation. Two people needed to stay home from work due to illness, and I was the only person available to assist customers. The task. I needed to answer phone calls from customers while assisting shoppers in the store. The action. I came up with a strategy that allowed me to assist customers as they entered the store, while also ensuring that customers who called were helped or politely placed on hold until I was able to address their needs. The result. I managed the in-store operations for the day without many mistakes, and my manager complimented me during the next team meeting. Hopefully this example highlights the benefits of answering open-ended interview questions using the STAR method. But the STAR method isn't the only strategy you can use during an interview. You can also answer questions with confidence. One way to demonstrate confidence is by admitting when you don't know something. For example, if an interviewer asks you to discuss a skill that you don't have, it's okay to admit you haven't learned it yet. However, the trick is to confidently mention that while you don't have that particular skill, you're a quick learner and eager to develop that skill. Treat it as an opportunity to emphasize your ability to adapt and learn on the job, which shows confidence. You know what else shows confidence? Taking the time to fully understand a problem or question to provide the best solution or answer possible. When interviewing, don't be afraid to ask the interviewer for a moment to think about your answer. It shows that you're willing to take the time needed to understand the question and provide a response that is meaningful and relevant. We've discussed a few strategies that can help you overcome the nervousness you may feel about interviewing for a job. Coming up, we'll continue to explore ways to prepare for interviews. In this video, we'll take a little time to discuss additional strategies you can use during a job interview. In past job interviews, your potential employer may have asked, do you have any questions for me? This type of question can be an opportunity for you to show the interviewer that you're prepared and ready to have a meaningful conversation with them. A big part of interview preparation is researching the company before the interview because it will allow you to ask questions that demonstrate you took the time to learn about the organization and its needs. For example, if you discover that the company suffered a major security breach two years ago, don't be afraid to ask about it. One question you could ask is, what do you think is the main reason the company suffered a breach two years ago? And follow that question up with, how could my role on the security team help prevent a breach like that in the future? These kinds of questions show that you are passionate about your career 
and that you want to help the company strengthen its security posture. There are also some general questions you can ask the interviewer to determine if the job and the organization itself are a good match for you. Here are some examples. What's the biggest challenge for a new person in this role? In what ways can I contribute to the success of the team and the organization? What qualities or traits are most important for working well with the team and other stakeholders? Questions like these can help you develop rapport with the interviewer and show that you're interested in learning more about the role and the organizational culture. Interviewing for jobs can be a really exciting process when you're prepared. And asking questions is an essential part of the interview process. Don't be afraid to ask potential employers tough questions. This will help them understand you as a thoughtful, curious person who can add value to the team. Coming up, we'll discuss another strategy, the elevator pitch. Now let's discuss a concept that can help you identify your strengths and allow you to highlight those strengths to others, an elevator pitch. An elevator pitch is a brief summary of your experience, skills, and background. It's called an elevator pitch because it should be short enough to say in 60 seconds or less, which is the average amount of time you might spend talking with someone on an elevator. Elevator pitches allow you to demonstrate who you are to potential employers in a very short time span. They can be used at job fairs, career expos, and other networking situations like professional conferences and social media job sites such as LinkedIn. Now let's examine how to create an elevator pitch. Your elevator pitch needs to be short and persuasive. There is no need to list all of your previous experiences and accomplishments. Instead, explain who you are and why you care about being a security professional, as well as the qualifications and skills you have that are specifically related to getting a job as a security analyst. For example, critical thinking, problem solving, and the ability to build collaborative relationships with others are transferable skills that most organizations are looking for. So highlight those in your elevator pitch. You could also mention technical skills you've learned in this certificate program, such as using various SIM tools and programming languages like SQL and Python to identify and respond to risks. Now we'll cover a few things to avoid when delivering your elevator pitch. It's important to avoid rambling or sharing irrelevant details during your elevator pitch. Potential employers only want to know who you are and why they should consider you for a security role. As you develop your elevator pitch, you're going to want to practice it several times. However, don't practice it so much that you end up sounding ingenuine or robotic when it's time to share your pitch with a possible decision maker. Instead, speak naturally, like you're having a conversation when you give your elevator pitch. That will help keep people engaged and interested in what you're saying. Another thing to avoid, speaking too quickly. Because an elevator pitch is fairly short, it can be easy to rush through it but that can cause people to miss out on some key skills you have to offer simply because you sped past them. One last tip, search the internet for elevator pitches to find examples that may help you generate ideas for your own pitch. In essence, your elevator pitch is a way to tell people why you are an amazing candidate for a security position with great skills and a clear direction for what you want to do in your career. While it's natural to be nervous when speaking to potential employers, just remember, take a deep breath, gather your composure, and deliver your pitch with confidence, conviction, and at a normal pace. You'll be just fine. You've done a great job completing this section of the course. Let's take a moment to review what we've covered. We started by discussing how to find and apply for jobs in the security field. Then, we explored how to create your resume. Next, we shared some strategies to develop rapport with interviewers. We also covered how to use the STAR method to answer open-ended interview questions thoughtfully. We finished by discussing how to develop an elevator pitch. 
Hopefully this has helped you feel confident as you begin to search and apply for jobs in the security field. Good luck. Congratulations on completing the final course of the certificate program. We covered a lot of information. So let's take a moment to review. We started by discussing how to protect assets and communicate incidents by developing a security mindset. Then we covered when and how to escalate incidents to the appropriate team members to make sure that small issues don't become big problems for an organization and the people it serves. Next, we explored ways to communicate effectively to influence stakeholders' decisions related to security. This included discussions about how to use visuals to convey important information, and sending emails, making phone calls, or sending instant messages. After that, we shared some ways to engage with the security community, including attending conferences and connecting with other analysts through a networking site. Then we moved on to the final section of the course, which covered how to find, prepare for, and apply for jobs. This included discussions about how to create a compelling resume and tips to help you navigate the interview process. It's been an absolute pleasure guiding you through this journey. This certificate covered some rigorous security content. You could have given up at any point, but you didn't. And for that, you deserve to be proud of yourself. As we discussed at the beginning of this program, the security field is growing and in need of security professionals just like you to help protect organizations around the world and the people they serve. The knowledge and skills you've obtained throughout this certificate program will allow you to begin applying for entry-level security analyst jobs. Now let's take a moment to summarize what we've discussed throughout this program. We started by exploring core security concepts, including the definition of security and core skills. Then we covered the focus of eight security domains and discussed how security supports critical organizational operations. Following that, we discussed network security, including network architecture and the mechanisms used to secure an organization's network. In the next course, we turned our focus to computing basics for security analysts. In this section, we introduced Linux and SQL. After that, we explored assets, threats, and vulnerabilities in depth. This included discussions about how assets are classified and the security controls used by organizations to protect valuable information and minimize risks. In the next course, we focused on incident detection and response. Here, we defined what a security incident is and explained the incident response lifecycle. In the following course, we introduced the Python programming language and explored how to develop code related to common security tasks. Finally, in the last course of the program, we explored topics related to your pathway into the security profession, including how to find and apply for jobs. You put a lot of valuable time and energy into completing this certificate program. Remember that the learning doesn't stop here. As you move forward in your career, always be mindful of the new trends developing in the world of security. As technology continues to advance, the threats to organizations and people will evolve as well. It's up to you to stay informed and always be willing to learn. You just completed the Google Cybersecurity Certificate. What a remarkable accomplishment that shows just how committed you are to learning new skills that will allow you to pursue your career goals. On behalf of myself and my fellow course instructors, congratulations. Congratulations. You did it. Congrats. I can't wait to see how many of you decide to pursue this career and visit some really cool places in cybersecurity. Way to go. Congratulations. Congratulations. You're a rock star. Congratulations. Congratulations. Great job. You did it. Congratulations. Congratulations. I am rooting for you and wishing you continued success. Congratulations on your big accomplishment. Now it's time to get to work. This is probably one of the best decisions you've ever made, and I can't wait to hear about all the opportunities that you're gonna experience. Congratulations. Congratulations, you've made it to the end, and you're now ready to keep everyone safe online. 
congratulations. Uh, continue to learn, continue to grow. Uh, you'll find this is a very rewarding career. Congratulations, you did it. Welcome to cybersecurity. The adventure continues after this. There's still a lot more to explore in the world of security, but you're off to a great start. It's been my pleasure guiding you through the final part of this program. I know you're well prepared to begin or continue a remarkable career in security. Congratulations and best of luck on your journey.